Welcome to the Defense and Airspace Report. I'm Fagam Radian here at the Association of the United States Army's annual conference and trade show in Washington, D.C. The number one gathering of U.S. Army leaders from around the world. Our coverage here is sponsored by General Motors Defense, Bell, L3 Harris and Leonardo DRS, and we're here on the Bell stand to talk to Keith Flail, who is uh, the Vice President uh, at Bell for Advanced Vertical Lift uh, Systems. Uh, Keith, great to see you. Terrific to actually see the 360 Invictus. You guys unveiled it in Washington a couple of weeks ago and we had a chance to talk. Why don't you give us a quick tour of the airplane and some of the features you guys have in this, because you're trying to shoot for the Army's requirement, the balance the Army wants for speed and payload, but also low operating cost and also high degree of sustainability. Absolutely, thanks, Vago. Um, if we can walk around and show you the aircraft. Yeah, and, when, and, the... and, and I will actually cede control of the microphone to Keith. Okay, well, thanks. <clears throat> yeah, so this is our uh, Bell 360 Invictus. So with uh, this offering for the United States Army uh, Future Attack Reconnaissance uh, aircraft, um, we are focused on being the most affordable, most sustainable, lowest risk and least complex solution in the fairest space while still meeting all the requirements. So in order to do that, as you look at the aircraft, first of all, a low drag, a tandem cockpit fuselage starting from the front of the aircraft working back. Um, two crew stations. Um, the aircraft can have two pilots, one pilot, or be optionally piloted. Uh, continue to move back. We have a, a retractable landing gear. Everything about this aircraft is keeping the drag as low as possible. Uh, continuing back, we have the lift sharing wing on the aircraft. Uh, with the fully articulated rotor system that comes from the uh, 525, um, <clears throat> we get a lot of uh, uh, technology reuse. And once we get up to 180 knots, we have 50% uh, uh, of the load is carried by the wing. So we have a very efficient propulsor with our main rotor. That's why our single main rotor helicopter will meet, meet the requirements with this combination of these features. Uh, continuing around the aircraft, um, it's powered by a GE improved turbine engine coupled with a supplemental power unit for uh, extra horsepower. Then we have an active horizontal stabilizer that keeps the aircraft in the best attitude to minimize drag. And then last, a uh, canted ducted tail rotor that uh, gives us some uh, extra performance in a hover. And also uh, that design uh, takes a lot of drag out when we're very high speeds. So the combination of all those features allows us to uh, exceed all the requirements. And we'll have this on the ramp in the fall of uh, 2022 for uh, first flight. And so we've miraculously hopped uh, into the cockpit. Keith, give us a little bit of a walk around because this is actually an optionally manned aircraft as well. So talk to us about a little bit of the features. And it's not just that the, the back seat is the pilot seat, but you guys actually have a lot of flexibility com uh, compared with a lot of uh, existing aircraft types. Yeah, so this is a uh, digital fly-by-wire aircraft as well as a uh, aircraft with uh, modular open system architecture. So uh, when you're, when you're uh, looking at the screens that we have here, working with Collins Aerospace as our teammate, uh, really focusing on you know what can we do uh, in terms of the ergonomics of the cockpit so that you reduce pilot workload as much as possible so that they can stay uh, outside the aircraft and fight the mission <coughs> and access all the functionality so what you see are a lot of uh, you know futuristic uh, you know we've grown up with the, the the next generation is coming up um, you know ipads touch screens all that so what, what can we do to provide the functionality the easiest way possible um, to the pilot so that they can execute the mission so the screens that you see there, you see attitude indicator, all of your uh, your mission pages, and then side stick controllers. You get your pedals and um, your uh, your collective here, and then your your side stick. So uh, being able to have uh, the, the most amount of situational awareness. Uh, Collins is an uh, um, industry leader in terms of uh, open system architecture, participating in the phase consortium, and then. Uh, also, uh, the opportunity to have um, distributed aperture system on the aircraft if the Army wants that, kind of like what we did for, for uh, B-280, so that you can have even greater situational awareness. So just trying to show the art of the possible here at uh, Association of the United States Army of all the things we're thinking about, uh, thinking about get that feedback from the community in terms of uh, how they want uh, this array, all the man-machine interface, those things that, uh, that we have to work on. And uh, you guys are also talking about one pilot, two pilot, or no pilot? Yeah, absolutely. With a fly-by-wire aircraft, um, the opportunity is to have you know two pilots as you see the two crew stations you can fly with one pilot or it can fly uh, optionally manned as we uh, continue to, to mature the technology um, being a fly-by-wire flight control system that you just it's just the next loop of uh, technology on top of it and uh, very very good visibility actually from the front right I mean given the angle of it you would think you wouldn't have as much visibility from the back seat but it's actually quite a quite a nice view even if you imagine uh, you know a gunner's uh, head yeah, right in front of you. Yeah, absolutely. So we, we do a lot of work and a lot of analysis to look at the visibility plots at all different angles so that, uh, you know, being a reconnaissance aircraft, you know, 
uh, the, the, the visibility is very, very important to the, to the mission. Um, and how do you respond to those who say, well, look, side-by-side -side seating is actually something better for this? Um, you know, you have flown attack helicopters as well uh, as uh, the Kai was, so you know side-by-side -side or fore and aft. Uh, do you see one as having benefits over another? Well, with where technology is now, I mean, there's, there's, there's you know, pluses and minuses of being tandem versus side by side and, and flying an aircraft. But the one thing that the uh, tandem configuration gives you, again, it's all about low drag. They want to, they need a high speed aircraft that has the ability to dash when it needs to, but also be a very efficient uh, hovering machine um, for the for the bread and butter, you know, reconnaissance and security type missions that they do. Well, and then the reason why you guys uh, developed the first purpose built, built attack helicopter was the Huey. You also wanted a small frontal area, uh, not just from a speed perspective, but also yeah, not smaller. to be seen. Yeah, absolutely, you're a smaller target when you're going towards the enemy when you're uh, when you're a tandem. So it's about drag and it's about uh, visibility, you know, to minimize your exposure. And uh, let me ask you a little bit about um, this extraordinary internal weapons bay they have, right? I mean, the Army dictated the size of that. Um, the service has said, we want to use this for weapons. We want to use these for unmanned systems, sort of like that, uh, as well as electromagnetic packages or fuel or anything else we may want to need. Talk to us a little bit about the size of that and what the weapons loadout on this is going to be. Because in some respects, this isn't a Kiowa replacement. It's actually an Apache replacement right, because Apaches are conducting that mission. So the Army is actually looking for something with a lot more payload capacity and a lot more attack capacity than what we would expect out of a Kiowa, which was a 90-knot airplane, and you're at 180 already. Yeah, so this is, uh, we, we understand that this would be complementary to the Apache as, uh, as they bring this into the, into the fleet, but the integrated munitions launcher that's under the wing, uh, maximizing that volume was one of the key attributes that they needed so that they could carry uh, today's weapons like Hellfires, uh, rockets, as well as air-launched effects, and then future weapons. So having as much volume within the belly of the aircraft is one of the design criteria so that uh, you can keep those weapons within uh, the aircraft so that you keep them out of the airstream, minimize drag, and then you actuate the weapons out uh, to do the engagements uh, as necessary. And... Uh you can also use it for fuel or not? Uh, right now we're focused on munitions, but absolutely if you have that volume in the aircraft, if the Army wants to do something different, kind of like what they did with the, uh, the Robby tanks and, and uh, with the Apache of mixing fuel um, <coughs> excuse me, and ammunition, uh, that's, that's an opportunity for them. Um, you guys also have prided yourselves on reinventing how you guys do the build process. The 525 was a complete reinvention uh, product. The V280 uh, that you're doing for the capability set three for the um, long range uh, assault uh, aircraft uh, is also your guys are priding yourselves on reinventing how you're designing it. This was very requirements heavy. The Army did have a lot of requirements that they put on you, which is why you look the way you do. But how are you guys going to try to re-engineer this airplane so that at the end of the day you're taking cost out of it and adding reliability which is something that you guys have been making a focus of. Yeah, so the Army's given us a, a lot of trade space on this one. So they have some hard you know, non-tradable requirements, but in terms of the trade space, the, again, with the offering that we went for, uh, most affordable, most sustainable, and still meeting all the requirements because of we're, we're really looking to minimize the complexity. We don't need uh, an extra propulsor. We don't need a complex transmission. We only need four main rotor blades. So that's the focus is how do you do this, meet the requirements with the, um, with the, the least complex solution possible. Um, and it's, it's really extraordinary that it's a 40-foot rotor diameter, which is really, really small for a helicopter um, this size. And uh, explain a little bit uh, for the audience the supplemental power unit and how that works, because you're going for uh, single-engine simplicity, but at the end of the day, you also want to get a little bit more oomph uh, on that. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, most aircraft in this uh, class, you're going to carry an auxiliary power unit. So for us, the uh, APU <coughs> excuse me, bides its way onto the aircraft, so it gives us that opportunity to add some horsepower when we need it. Uh, for key uh, a key aspects of the mission and uh, certain times the mission profile, so I'd almost correlate it to uh, in your car when you're when you're driving if you want economy mode or not. So depending upon what you're doing on uh, day five of multi-domain operations versus day 50, you may be flying different mission profiles. So that gives you that opportunity to not just have as an APU, but also get that horsepower boost when you need it. Um, one of your competitors is making, uh, well, we should say the Boeing Sikorsky team is saying, hey, you know, we've got, um, you know, almost a 50 knot advantage, um, you know, in, in terms of what the speed difference is between the two of them. Note for the record, the Kiowa was a 90 knot, you were a Kiowa pilot, it was a 90 knot airplane, uh, roughly, not that there's anything wrong with that. Um, what is the kind of top speed you guys are approaching for this, and do you think that that gives the other guy an edge in terms of speed? Yeah, well, what I can tell you right now is the Army's been very clear that the uh, cruise airspeed at max continuous power has to be 180 knots. We are clearly above 180 knots. We'll continue to do our work and our design, um, and we'll, you know, we'll put out more information later, but we absolutely meet the requirement. Uh, we validated that with the Army. That is the hard requirement is 180.
And uh, one of the other things that a lot of Scott pilots uh, that I've talked to here have been asking is whether or not there are going to be sensors in that hub to allow you to give you a little bit of those mass-mounted effects. What's the Army's thinking on that? Because obviously any Kiowa guy really liked that mass-mounted sight uh, at the end of the day that allowed you to lay really, really low but be able to see over things. Yeah, so right now we're, we're working uh, with the Army. I mean, it looks like a common sensor payload on the front of the aircraft is the way that we're configured with a, a sensor ball in the nose. Uh, there, you know, there's been trades over the years in terms of a mass-mounted sight versus one that's in the nose. Current configuration that we have has it in the, uh, the nose of the aircraft. As a former scout pilot, would you rather see a mast on it at the end of the day? We're here to meet our customers' requirements. <laughs> great answer, Keith. Really appreciate it. Keith Flail from, uh, from uh, Bell. It's really great to see the airplane uh, here. It's very, very cool and very reminiscent of Comanche. The number of folks uh, on, on our site who made comments about that is like, hey, you know, it looks a little Comanche-like. Uh, very, very good. And you said um, the first flight is going to be when, roughly? Yeah, yeah stay tuned. Fall of uh, 2022, we're going to hit first flight for uh, long-range assault aircraft for B-280. Back in 2012, we said we were going to fly in uh, the fall of 2017, and we did. And we're bringing that cycle of learning towards this one, so we're going to fly this one in the fall of 2022. Waiting for that down select in, uh, in March, just like everybody else. Uh, and March, what is the down select? Uh, down select to go from uh, the, the current five um, uh, competitors that are in down to two. Very good. Sir, thanks very much, and we'll be staying tuned. Thank you. Thank you, Vago. Appreciate it.